Therefore, it is time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Office. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. This Liberal government has no business in possibly spending millions of hard-earned taxpayer dollars on self-promoting hydro ads. They are blatantly partisan, and they are littering radio stations and social media in a sad attempt to save this government's falling popularity. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier do the right thing and stop spending public dollars on these advertisements and order that they be cancelled today? Yes or no? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, um, I've been uh, traveling uh, the province. I've been talking to people for months, Mr. Speaker, including last week, and people are very, very concerned about their uh, hydro bills, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the opposition knows that. He knows, Mr. Speaker, as does the third party. They know that people are looking for relief. That the uh, that the the work that we have done up until now, Mr. Speaker, that there's more that we need to do. That's why the 25% reduction is very important. So, Mr. Speaker, we're moving ahead with our plan I would have thought that given the given the noise from the other side mr. speaker they understand that people are concerned about their electricity bills that they would be supportive of the changes that we are bringing yes, forward sir. mr. speaker that will give real relief to people across the province Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. And as the Premier travels the province, no one is asking for more government vanity ads. No. It, it, the Liberal government has a bad track record, a long track record of misusing taxpayer-funded ads for partisan purposes. We all remember the $8.1 million in self-congratulatory ads for the job-killing pension scheme that never came to fruition. $8.1 million just to pat themselves Order. on the back. Mr. Speaker, how many millions of dollars is this government going to waste on more self-congratulatory radio ads? So, Mr. Speaker, you know, the two issues that the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition has raised, retirement security for people across the province and lower electricity rates, Mr. Yes, Speaker. I'm extremely proud of our record on delivering both of those, Mr. Speaker. This leader of the opposition, Mr. Speaker, sat in a federal government for nine years. Stop. Federal government, Mr. Speaker, for nine years, that wouldn't even talk to the province about retirement security. We wouldn't even talk about Canada Pension Plan enhancement, Mr. Speaker. We've moved on that. We now have a national agreement on on uh, on pension uh, enhancement, Mr. Speaker. We have an enhanced Canada Answer. Pension Plan because of the work that we did on the ORPP, Mr. Speaker. In addition, we're going to deliver lower electricity rates, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound, come to order. Sup, uh, final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, it really is unbelievable. When people can't afford their hydro bill, this government is spending millions on vanity ads, self-promoting their own agenda. You know, I'm going to read a quote from the Auditor General. The ads likely would not have been approved under the old government advertising rules. That's Auditor General Bonnie Lysick. Lysick. The changes the Liberals enacted in 2015 reduce her office to a rubber stamp. I'll, I'll continue the quote from the Auditor General. Under the previous Chief legislation, Whip, it would likely not have passed because it does convey a positive impression of the current government, and it's more a pat-on-the-back type of advertising. Yep. Those rules were put into place to prevent Liberal wasting taxpayer dollars yep. on vanity ads. They changed the rules so that they could use taxpayer dollars to promote themselves. So, you know, the government can dance, the government can point the finger, the government can avoid answering the question. Very funny. For years, they complained about these type of ads when they're in opposition. They come to government Question. and change the rules to, to not allow this to happen, and now they're doing the same thing. Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, are you going to continue you. with these vanity ads? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. 
this is this is a very important issue, and the reality is that uh, when this government came into office under my predecessor, there were uh, there were virtually no rules around partisan advertising, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, I can remember sitting in this gallery and listening to the Liberal opposition. The member from Dufferin Caledon, come to order. I can remember sitting in this gallery, Mr. Speaker, when the Liberal opposition was asking the uh, then Tory, Tory government about uh, advertising that had the Premier's face in it, Mr. Speaker, yeah, that was Premier all Clinton. over. There, there were kids out of school there. because there were strikes, Mr. Speaker. There were hospitals being closed. The uh, amalgamations were being imposed, Mr. Speaker. Chaos was reigning, and the Premier of the day had his face all over Thank advertising. You. We changed so those rules, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Question, the of the Mr. Speaker, um, uh, to the Premier, since I can't get an answer on the government vanity ads, I'm going to try a new approach. A recent big, bold headline read, Ontario nursing homes feed seniors at $8.33 a day. Mr. Speaker, does the Premier believe that is enough to nutritiously feed Ontario's vulnerable senior citizens? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I know that the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care is going to want to, to speak to this. We have been working very closely with the Long-Term Care Association and with uh, long-term care uh, homes around the province, Mr. Speaker. There have been thousands more uh, beds built, Mr. Speaker, and upgrades to uh, beds across the province. We know that there's more work to be done, Mr. Speaker. We also know that given the aging demographic, this is the uh, member from Bruce Gray Owens Sound second time, and I've got two others in my sight, and because of that, I might move to warnings, and I will do so if necessary. Please finish. Mr. Speaker, uh, 10,000 new long-term care beds have been built and another 13,500 have been redeveloped. So, Mr. Speaker, we know that there is more work Answer. to be done and we will work very closely with the Long-Term Care Association as we move forward. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. The $8.33 wasn't even the most shocking stat in that article. Mr. Speaker, do you know what shocked me more? I'll tell you. It was the fact that Ontario spends over a dollar more a day on prisoners' food than it does on seniors' long-term care. More on prisoners Chief Governor than Whip, seniors. Second time. I know when it comes to a choice of who we're going to support, if it, is it seniors or is it prisoners, I'm with seniors. It is unbelievable that this government has made this allocation. Mr. Speaker, why do prisoners eat better than seniors in Premier Wins, Ontario? And I would like the Premier to answer this, please, Mr. Here, Speaker. Here, here, here. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? The member from Dundas, South Glengarry, come to order. And Stormont. Long-term care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And of course, uh, the number that the uh, leader of the opposition uh, is referring to is our provincially mandated minimum that is required by long-term care homes to spend on raw food. And raw food doesn't include the costs which we fund separately for food preparation. It doesn't include the costs for serving the food. Uh, the menus that the long-term care homes uh, prepare have to be approved on site by a dietitian, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, we provide tremendous flexibility within the budget that we provide long-term care homes, $142 Answer. per day per resident, flexibility within that to allow for additional expenditures in raw food. Thank you. Speaker. Yeah. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, when it comes to government ads, there's millions of dollars to spend on self-promotion. When it comes to seniors, there's nothing. The Ontario Association of Non-Profit Homes and Services for Seniors 
is only asking for 33 cents a day. Prisoners would still be getting more than seniors. How is this fair? The lack of respect that we're seeing for seniors yep. is unbelievable. Yep. They deserve so much better. And so no matter how the Minister of Health spins it, how the Premier spins it, the reality is under their rules, under their allocations, we're taking better care of prisoners than we are seniors. These are people's fathers and mothers. These are grandparents. These are our grandparents. Is this, Premier, is this how you want to treat our seniors? Mr. Speaker, will the Premier stand up and say this Question. is unacceptable? Thank you. Premier. That's some legacy. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, last year in our budget that they voted against, we incre increased the budget for raw food and the diet of uh, for raw food for uh, residents of long-term care homes. We increased that by 3.7 percent, well above that. the cost of inflation of food wow. inflation, Mr. Speaker. But we're listening to our stakeholders, our partners in long-term care home, as they bring uh, forward suggestions, proposals in advance of the budget, Mr. Speaker. Uh, both both in terms of the quantum that's uh, required for uh, for raw food, and I should should mention that we have a, a line item in the budget called other accommodation, which is fifty-four dollars and fifty-two cents per resident per day. All long-term care homes have the opportunity to draw on that $54 in addition to that that we put aside for raw food Answer. to provide, as they are mandated to, a nutritional diet for their residents, Mr. Speaker. Okay. New question, the Leader of the Third Party. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The Premier and her Liberal government ads touting their phantom hydro plan have been condemned by the Auditor General as a pat on the back partisan exercise that would never have been allowed before the Liberals changed the rules on advertising. Speaker, Can the Premier tell Ontarians what the price tag is for these self-serving ads? Again, Mr. Speaker, I will just uh, remind the leader of the third party that we were the province in this country that actually introduced rules around yeah. partisan advertising. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, before this government under my predecessor came into office, those rules didn't exist. Mr. Speaker, we put in place rules that said partisan advertising and as it is unacceptable. In reaction, Mr. Speaker, to Reaction, Mr. Speaker, to the uh, really egregious advertising that had been done by the uh, the Conservatives, Mr. Speaker, that that was so blatantly partisan that it was uh, it was obvious that there needed to be restrictions put in place. Those restrictions are in, Member in from place, Dufferin Mr. Caledon, Speaker, second time. and we adhere to them. Supplementary. Speaker, I feel like it's comedy hour in the legislature. This government changed the rules and then changed them back so that they could use public money to advertise and promote themselves when they get into political trouble. Not one dime has come off of the skyrocketing hydro bills. Then this premier has not tabled a plan yet, or even any legislation yet, to show Ontarians what their money is going to be spent on or if they're even going to save any money in the future. But she is still spending more money on advertising, claiming that the problem's been solved. How much is this attempt to buy some political relief on hydro bills going to cost Ontarians? Mr. Speaker, let me just remind the leader of the third party that we have a plan that actually will reduce people's electricity bills, Mr. Speaker, and will reduce those bills by the summer, Mr. Speaker. Substantial re relief, 25% on average off all bills across the province, Mr. Speaker, for residents who pay electricity in their homes, Mr. Speaker. Further relief for people who are paying disproportionately high distribution costs, Mr. Speaker, in remote and rural areas, and an enhancement to the Ontario Electricity Support Program that will help people on low income. Mr. Speaker, it's a substantial program that will deliver relief and will deliver it in a timely manner, Mr. Speaker. And I'm so pleased that the leader of the third party is eager to get going on that plan, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to her support as we move forward. Well, Speaker, instead of partisan ads, how about we actually
actually see the plan. We hear a lot of talk, we see a lot of press releases, but we have not yet seen a plan. These ads are obviously much more about the Premier and her Liberal Party instead of making life more affordable for the people of Ontario. How much public money, how Member much public Durham, money is this Premier spending on advertising, Speaker, for the month? Stop the clock. In case you didn't hear it, the member from Durham come to order. The Minister from Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation, come to order. Please. How much public money is this Premier and her Liberal Party spending on advertisements for the billion-dollar hydro borrowing scheme that she has still not made public? Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I am so pleased that we are talking about our plan, yes. the plan that we brought forward, that is actually going to reduce people's electricity bills across the country. Really because, Mr. Speaker, it is a substantial plan, and, and it actually will work, Mr. Speaker. So. I was at uh, I was at a business this uh, this past week, Mr. Speaker, called Jadar, and it's Remember in from Hamilton East Stony Creek. Um, no, Barry, Mr. Speaker. I was in Barry at uh, at a great chocolate and cheese shop, Mr. Oh. Speaker. They're going to see a substantial reduction in their electricity bill, which is going to allow them, Mr. Speaker, to expand their business. They are uh, they're building a, a patio on the back of their store, Jadar, and it is going to be a real anchor on the main street in. Uh, uh, in Barrie, Mr. Speaker. That's the kind yes, of sir. business we want to see thrive, and that's why it's so important that the real plan that we are bringing forward is going to Thank give you. them real relief. New question, the leader of the third party. My next question is also for the Premier Speaker. You know, the Premier has shown Ontarians where her priorities are self serving, partisan, radio ads first, actual legislation, or a tangible plan sometime later, I guess. Ontario families, businesses, and public institutions like hospitals have a right to know what will happen to their hydro bill, Speaker, and who will pay the price for the $40 billion going to line the pockets of bankers. When, when will the Premier finally table her proposed hydro plan so that people know how and by when and rather and by how much the bills are going to end up going up? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to, uh, to rise and talk about uh, when we're going to be bringing forward the legislation this spring to reduce everyone's bills by 25 percent, Mr. Speaker, in time so they can have this relief, uh, Mr. Speaker, before summer. And I know there will be time for proper debate and public hearings. I now know, Mr. Speaker, the opposition critics have received a technical briefing on our plan, and they've also received comprehensive briefing documents, including technical decks, Mr. Speaker, backgrounds, our speeches and sample bills demonstrating the reductions that are going to be happening, Mr. Speaker. And I know our plan, Mr. Speaker, is going to offer real relief, Mr. Speaker, for all of our families and small businesses and farms right across the province. I know the opposition parties, Mr. Speaker, they're putting forward nothing but platitudes, Mr. Speaker. Our plan is going to make sure that we bring forward real relief for families, for small businesses, for farms right across the province, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to make sure it happens before summer. Supplementary. 
2011 to 2015, the hospital in Sault Ste. Marie saw their hydro bill ra rise by $2.7 million, an increase of 45 per cent in just four short years, while their hydro consumption during that time frame remained exactly the same. Since the Premier refuses to release her plan, will she be running an ad soon to let hospitals like the one in the Sioux know uh, if they're going to see relief on their hydro bills anytime soon? Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I know uh, the third party needs to stop misleading Ontarians about the health care misleader. Member withdraw. I will withdraw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. Um, confusing Ontarians about our health care system, Mr. Speaker. Since coming into office, we've increased hospital funding by 54 per cent, allowing us to treat more patients, provide better care, and reduce wait times to some of the shortest in the country, Mr. Speaker. Now, I know both opposition parties are, are furiously trying to muddy the, the record by mis, you know, not necessarily confusing the impact of energy, energy costs, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that hospitals spend 1.6 per cent on average of their total operating budgets on electricity. That means well over 95 per cent of hospital budgets go towards the rest, Mr. Speaker, hiring nurses and doctors, keeping wait times low, and ensuring access uh, patients have access to that high-quality services yes, that they need. Mr. Speaker, hospitals are also eligible for the Save on Energy program, and I'll talk more about that in the supplementary. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's not just families at home, businesses or hospitals that are suffering either. Municipalities are also worried about whether the Premier's $40 billion borrowing deal will actually help them keep community facilities open. When I met with leaders from Echo Bay, Deborah, Bruce Mines, Hilton Beach, St. Joseph and Batchewana First Nation not long ago, they all told me that skyrocketing hydro rates are on the verge of closing their local arenas or community centres. Since this Premier refuses to release the details of her $40 billion borrowing plan, will she run an ad soon to let local municipal leaders know if they're going to get some real relief from soaring hydro bills and be able to keep community centres like arenas open? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to begin by saying that since forming government, we've increased wow. municipal support to nearly four times what it was yeah. in 2003. So, you know, Mr. Speaker, unlike the previous uh, Conservative government, which downloaded billions of dollars uh, on costs onto the backs of municipalities and residential uh, property taxpayers, we are alleviating the financial burden off of our municipal partners, Mr. Speaker. Um, residents in every single one of Ontario's 444 municipalities, Mr. Speaker, will benefit benefit from the Fair Hydro Plan, Mr. Speaker. And talking about municipalities, I know the mayor uh, in Hamilton was in the news recently talking about our Fair Hydro Plan. He says a 25 per cent reduction is a very positive step for the city's hydro customers, and he credited our government with listening to Ontarians and implementing what he calls dramatic reductions. Mr. Speaker, this is the mayor of the leader of the third party's own city, Mr. Speaker. So it begs the question, Mr. Speaker, come when this legislation is brought forward, will they support this and will they follow the advice of the mayor of Hamilton and make sure they support us? in supporting this 25 per cent reduction. Thank you. New question. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Over the last five years, 350 frontline health care workers have been cut from the North Bay Regional uh, Health Centre. That includes 100 nurses, and 60 beds have been closed in this new hospital. This week, between 30 and 40 more health care workers will be sent home. Speaker, we can't take much more of this in North Bay. Their jobs are being lost as a direct result of Liberal waste, mismanagement and scandals. To add to their troubles, the hospital has seen a hydro increase of 65 per cent over the last six years. The hospital CEO says that with these latest cuts, he's starting to be very worried about patient care. My question to the Premier is this. Do you care enough about the patients in North Bay 
to do something. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we're proud. And I think the member opposite. Uh, if asked, would admit as well, pr proud of that brand new facility uh, in North Bay, wow. uh, the hospital that's providing excellent, the highest quality of care, and that has never been a question, Mr. Speaker, and never been in doubt. Uh, last year in the budget, in the budget that they, of course, voted down, where we allocated uh, 345 million new dollars to hospitals, that included, Mr. Speaker, a 2 percent increase in the funding that we provided to North Bay Regional Health Centre. Uh, we have funded it, increased the funding year over year over year so that they can address those pressures that they naturally do face, Mr. Speaker, but continue to provide the highest quality of care to the community that they serve. They have approached the ministry, Mr. Answer. Speaker, in this uh, current fiscal year, and I'm happy to address that in the supplementary. Yeah. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Uh, back to the Premier. With the $107 million cut from the OLG uh, funding to hospitals, virtually the same dollars are being reallocated every year, and most of the funds get distributed to the high-growth areas. But even though our communities in the north are not growing, our seniors are aging. We also have a higher incidence of many chronic diseases in the north. And because of these extra costs and increased hydro bills, the hospital didn't quite balance their budget this year. That makes them ineligible for the $7 million in working capital relief. They're in a no-win downward spiral. My question to the Premier is simple. Will she readmit North Bay Regional Health Centre into the relief program, allowing them to hit their targets and stop this downward cycle? Question. Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as I mentioned, we have received a request uh, from the hospital. We're working closely with them and with the Lynn in strong collaboration and partnership, which I should point out, Mr. Speaker, is something that that party, when they were in government in North Bay, absolutely did not do. In 2001, North Bay Hospital faced a $6.5 million deficit. And at the time, uh, Mike Harris said, quote, North Bay and Sturgeon Falls and Mattawa that have deficits are not going to be able to be funded in future years, Mr. Speaker, oh, making it clear that the writing. PC government would not work with hospitals to maintain writing. services. Wow. We don't work that way, Mr. Speaker. We're working closely with the hospital today. Thank you. New question. Leader of the third party. It's for the Speaker. Today, the NDP will, reduce, uh, will introduce rather a Rent Protection for All Tenants Act. This act will close the loophole that allows landlords in buildings built later than 1991 to hike rents as much as they want, whenever they want. We hear from families that say these increases are chasing them from their home, Speaker, the place they're raising their kids. Will the Premier close this unfair loophole to protect renters in Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Housing. Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker. It's a, uh, a very good question. You know, it's really unacceptable that uh, so many Ontarians are faced with housing costs that are uh, raising, uh, rising so dramatically. You know, families on tight budgets really are feeling the pinch of a rental market that a rental market that is struggling to keep up with demand. So we've been we've been already working on a number of areas since last June. We've been consulting with uh, with tenants and landlords and others right across the province, looking at the Residential Tenancy Act and what we'll be able to do to uh, to tweak that to make things better. We've uh, we've passed the inclusionary zoning that will allow uh, municipalities uh, another tool for municipalities to use to construct affordable housing. There's a whole number of things, a whole host of things that I'd love to go down this list, Mr. Speaker, and I'll do that in the supplementary. Answer. Thank you. Supplementary. Let's hope it doesn't take them uh, as long as it took for inclusionary zoning, Speaker, to yeah. fix the 1991 rule. The fact is that many Ontarian house, Ontario households are at a tipping point right now, Speaker. Some people are seeing rent increases of hundreds of dollars, if not $1,000. More and more working people are being forced to couch surf or even return to their parents' home, Speaker. Premier Wynn has said for years uh, that, uh, rather, re pre Premier Wynn has had a number of years, Speaker, already to fix this problem, uh, but, but instead is leaving millions of Ontario's, Ontario's residents, Ontario's renters, in the lurch. My question is, why has she failed to take action thus far? Thank you. Minister. 
Well, thank you uh, again for that follow-up question. You know, the, the, this government has done a, a number of very important things, Speaker, on top of uh, talking with landlords and tenants right across the province about uh, issues they face every day, especially around the Residential Tenancy Act. You know, I mentioned inclusionary zoning. I can talk about how we have uh, frozen the municipal property tax on apartment buildings to provide relief to renters. Uh, we've doubled the maximum refund for first-time uh, home buyers. Uh, right. Right now, Speaker, we're collecting data to better understand Ontario's housing market. But uh, when it when it comes to the uh, when it comes to the uh, the exemption, the 1991 exemption, uh, Mr. Speaker, you know we have said that we will be expanding on that, and we will bring legislation that deals with that, along with uh, the RTA. So we are listening, Speaker. Yes, we sir. know the problem that uh, that people face, uh, not only in Toronto but right across Ontario, and we're taking Thank action. You. Question: The member from Barry. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Minister, increases in home prices and rents have made housing affordability a concern for a growing number of people. In fact, it's an issue that I've heard from my constituents about time and time again. A year ago in my riding, my office was unable to find even a single room to rent for a constituent with a budget of $500 a month, wow, and point. prices have only skyrocketed since then. Mr. Speaker, I frequently hear from young families looking to buy their first home who are having a challenging time getting into the market in the Greater Toronto Area. Could the minister please explain what steps our government has taken to improve housing affordability? Minister of Finance. I understand that housing affordability yes. has become a significant issue, not just for those families living in the Greater Toronto Area, but in many communities across the province. It's why our government doubled the maximum refund for the land transfer tax rebate of $4,000. We doubled that refund. More than half of first-time homebuyers now in Ontario will pay no LTT on the purchase of their first home. We also know that renters are struggling to find affordable places to live, which is why we are freezing municipal property taxes on apartment buildings to give relief to renters. And Mr. Speaker, we're also participating very closely alongside the B.C. government as well as, uh, as cities of Toronto and Vancouver in a federal working group in the housing market. Thank you. Here, here. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Minister of Finance. I'm pleased to hear that the government is taking steps to address this issue. That extra money could be part towards closing costs, a larger down payment, or new appliances for first-time buyers' home. Right. I'm also happy to hear that the government is continuing to work on further ways to make it more affordable for Ontarios to buy a home. Mr. Speaker, I know that our government has been participating alongside the B.C. government, the cities of Toronto and Vancouver, in a federal housing market working group to look up look at further ways to improve affordability. Could the minister please provide an update as to how he is working with other levels of government to help make housing more affordable for the people in Ontario? Yeah. Thank, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you to the member from Barrie. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uncertainty in the housing market has been partially driven by speculation. In fact, just today, TD Economics released a special report on the housing market arguing that the heightened uncertainty in the market can be largely attributed to speculation. There are a number of options to reduce speculative investment in the housing market that could raise revenue to support other housing affordability measures. It's why I've sent a letter to the Federal Minister of Finance to request that the federal government consider increasing the capital gains inclusion rate for non-principal residences. Under the current rule, when you sell a home that is not your principal residence for a profit, only 50 per cent of the capital gain is included in taxable income. Mr. Speaker, this change will be an important step toward keeping our country's housing market stable and curbing price acceleration. I look forward to continuing to work collaboratively with yes, the federal sir. government to make housing more affordable for Ontario families. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Your question, the member from Halliburton, Portland Lakes, Brock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. We all know that sexual assault is a big problem in our communities and that our public institutions haven't always shown the proper sensitivity in responding to this crime. Two weeks ago, the Federal House of Commons gave unanimous support to a bill that would require would-be judges to receive sexual assault training. 
But last week, victim service organizations were disappointed to hear that the government of Ontario has no plans to follow suit in making sexual assault training mandatory for its judicial appointees. Why won't the government take the issue of sexual assault seriously and require potential judges to receive the training they need to properly handle sensitive sexual assault cases? Here, here. Attorney General. Attorney General. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for, for this question. It's a very important issue, and uh, Speaker, I know it's, it's an issue that uh, that uh, all members of this legislature and Ontarians in, in general are, are uh, are always uh, concerned about. Speaker, we know that sexual assault is a, is a serious issue that demands attention from all levels of government. And that's why, Speaker, I'm very proud that our government, through introduce its, ne its never okay uh, strategy, it's a $41 million action plan, uh, Speaker, to stop sexual violence and harassment. It's our Premier who's taking a leadership role in ensuring that we have, uh, we have robust programs to ensure that we, uh, that we put an end to sexual violence and harassment in our province. As a result of that uh, plan, Speaker, we have launched a free independent legal advice pilot program for survivors of sexual assault. 100 people uh, so far, Speaker, have accessed the program. We have increased funding to, uh, to the 42 Answer. sexual assault centers across Ontario by $1.75 million, Speaker, for a total of $14.8 million. And we have passed Thank legislation you. removing barriers for survivors of sexual assault. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, requiring judges to be trained to handle sexual assault cases uh, is the right thing to be doing. Uh, alluding to the fact that judges can be trained through ads is a, quite an incredible answer from the Minister uh, of the Attorney General. Shameful. Uh, in fact, training judges would actually strengthen Ontario's trust in the judicial system. If Ontarians knew that judges were trained to handle sexual assault cases with the proper sensitivity, maybe more victims would be willing to come forward. So again, to the Premier, will she accept the common sense proposal to require our judges to be trained to handle sexual assault cases, since the Minister of the Attorney General is not saying yes, Mr. Speaker? Speaker, this is a very serious judge. issue. Speaker, this is a, a issue that is uh, uh, not partisan in nature whatsoever. Speaker, no. uh, I'm very proud of our premier for taking a leadership role when it comes to a very definitive action plan on putting an end to sexual violence and harassment in our province. Speaker, what we also have to be mindful of is that we have an independent judiciary. Yeah. Uh, we have to respect the independence of judiciary, and when it comes to training and education of our judiciary, yeah. that is an independent matter. Speaker, that is uh, that is decided upon by the Chief Justices of the Superior Court of Justice and the Ontario Court Order. of Justice. Uh, speaker, uh, in Ontario, judges function separately and independently of the government, and training and education are within their exclusive jurisdiction. Uh, the, the, the member from Dufferin Caledon is warned. You have a wrap-up sentence, please. However, uh, Speaker, we are always open to talking about more training uh, for, uh, around sexual violence and harassment, Speaker. And thank you. Thank you. New question. A member from Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est pour la Première Ministre. Uh, thank you, Monsieur, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Speaker. Uh, to the uh, Prime Minister, uh, to the Premier, access. But under this Liberal government, a growing number of private clinics are running a second tier of health services in our province. These elite private clinics can charge up to $4,000 a year for members to get faster access to physician or faster access to MRI or both. It's called queue jumping, Speaker. Does the Premier think that it is right to force most people to wait longer for the health care that they need, while rich people can buy their way to the front of the line? And if not, then why is the Premier letting private clinic undermine our public health care here in Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, I know, uh, like myself, the member opposite is absolutely committed to Medicare and to the Canada Health Act and the principles behind that. And, uh, and I think, and I would hope that she knows she's been 
watching uh, my uh, performance as health minister for almost three years now. I hope that she also sees uh, those principles in action, uh, the importance uh, to me personally and professionally as a health care provider as she is to uh, health equity, to ensuring that those vulnerable individuals, those that truly and most need access to health services, that that's where we focus our attention that on that incredibly uh, important issue of access as well, that it is fair and equal and equitable access, Mr. Speaker. We are closely monitoring some activities that are taking place, including uh, what she's just referenced, Mr. Speaker, uh, and we're looking to ensure that those principles are upheld. Yeah. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I've been bringing this issue of the private clinic growing in Ontario for the last five years. This is a long time to monitor what's going on. Ask any mom in Ontario how long it takes to get an appointment with their family physician for her sick child. It can take weeks. But under the Liberal, people can pay a private clinic for 24-7 access to a doctor. Ask any seniors how long it takes to get an MRI. I went on the website today. Average wait time, 106 days. But at a private clinic, people can pay to get an MRI within one or two days, forcing everybody else to wait longer. Speaker, when you need access to high-quality health care in Ontario, you should be asked for your health card, not your credit card. Does the Premier think that patients in Ontario should pay up or wait longer Question. for the health care that they need? Minister. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, um, I guess my memory must be failing me because in the three years that I've been health minister, the member opposite has not raised this issue with me, uh, by my recollection, at all in the three-year period. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, now that it is uh, in the Toronto Star, I know that she's uh, seen it as an important issue, as do we. And that's why in 2004, Mr. Speaker, we introduced legislation that made it illegal for any person or entity to charge or accept any benefit for an insured service in addition to the amount that is paid by OHIP. We also made it illegal, Mr. Speaker, for any person to pay, charge, or receive payment or other benefits to receive special or expedited access to the Medicare system. However, Mr. Speaker, this is important to this government, as demonstrated by the legislation in 2004. Answer. We are continuing to watch this very, very closely to ensure that it does not violate that act Thank or the you. Canada Health Act. Mr. Yeah. Yeah. Question the member from Beaches East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Now, we know that the Ontario festivals and the events we have here attract tourists, support tens of thousands of jobs, and generate millions in economic growth. And I'm very proud to be part of a government that supports these events so people can be drawn and visit and celebrate in our communities. At my own riding of Beaches East York, I'm very pleased to know that we're assisting with the Canadian Food Truck Festival, the Toronto Vocal Arts Festival called Sing, which celebrates a cappella music, Woodstock. Beaches, the iconic Beaches International Jazz Festival, and of course Carabana, which has had a long history in the city of Toronto. And we, are, we, we have been seeing these festivals, and we know that these events play a fundamental role in our cultural and economic vitality. So, Speaker, I'm pleased to ask the Minister today about an announcement that she made last Monday at Mills Hardware in Hamilton. Question. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister tell the members of this House more about what was announced on Thank Monday? You and how the Celebrate Ontario is improving our community. Thank you. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Beaches East York for the question and for his championing of events and the arts community in his riding, Speaker. Earlier this month, I was with Sonic Union, the creators of Super Crawl in Hamilton, an annual festival that transforms James Street into a weekend-long celebration of the arts. Here, visitors can see great musical acts, unique art installations, and experience amazing local food and craft beer right in the heart of downtown Hamilton. Super Crawl has been around for almost a decade now, and it's grown into a must-see for music and art lovers. Speaker, we're proud to be supporting Super Crawl with over a half a million dollars over two years, wow, along with five nice. other initiatives in Hamilton. In participating in events like Super Crawl, visitors might make a stop at the fabulous Art Gallery of Hamilton or Theatre Aquarius, two pillars of the local arts and culture scene. Speaker, we know that these events draw tourists, but we're also investing in a growing cultural scene. And I'm proud of our contributions Sir. to such a culture scene and looking forward to talking about the impact Celebrate Ontario is making right across Ontario in my supplementary. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Supplementary. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the uh, Minister for her answer and for her incredible champion of events all across Ontario. So many festivals and events like Super Crawl, as she mentioned, and North by Northeast, which also receives significant funding, and up in Thunder Bay, the World Junior Baseball Classic, are having a very positive impact on the music and the culture scenes of Ontario. Across the province, Celebrate Ontario 2017 means that organizers can now enhance their programming, their activities, and their services. They now offer new and enhanced experiences that attract even more tourists and increase visitor spending. I know that Celebrate Ontario will have a very positive economic impact in every corner of the province in 2017, our 150 celebratory year. From food festivals, music festivals, to events that teach us about our heritage and cultural diversity, our communities will benefit from increased tourism and visitor spending right Question. across the province. So, Speaker, through you to the Minister, will she update the members of this House on the economic impacts expected from Celebrate Ontario investments this summer? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member for the question. You know, our government understands the important role that festivals and events play in bringing yeah, yeah. communities together and supporting local businesses. In this respect, Celebrate Ontario has been enormously successful. Later this afternoon, I'll be in Markham, along with Minister Chan, to highlight the multicultural aspects of Celebrate Ontario. In fact, every dollar of Celebrate Ontario funding triggers almost $20 of visitor expenditures, supporting thousands of jobs and generating millions of dollars in revenue. These festivals Festivals enhance quality of life and they attract investment too. Knowing the strength of this program and the important opportunity we have, especially in our sesquicentennial year, our government is investing more than $19 million across wow. Ontario. We're supporting over 300 festivals and events, a record number in the history of Ontario, Speaker. This commitment will have a province-wide impact and we're proud of it, Speaker. We're also proud that we're doing a tremendous yes. amount in local and northern communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Question the member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Today we heard the Ontario Long-Term Care Association how this government has abdicated its responsibility to properly fund long-term care, leaving hundreds of thousands of seniors to go without the care they need and deserve. 11,000 people, myself included, signed a petition to call on you to stand up for seniors by ensuring funding for fundamentals like food and hydro and nursing homes never again falls below inflation. On behalf of all of them, I ask, will the minister commit to actually providing stable and predictable funding to support the needs of those most vulnerable seniors entrusted in his care? Here, here. Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Uh, Mr. Speaker, of course this government is committed to providing that ongoing and stable funding uh, to seniors uh, and others that reside in uh, long-term care homes across this province. You know that's partly why we made, and I just referenced the 3.7% increase in the uh, raw food diet in last year's budget. That's why we have committed by 2025 to redeveloping 30,000 new long-term care beds. That's why, in fact, since since coming into office in 2003, Mr. Speaker, we have built more than 10,000 new beds yep. in long-term care. And I have a list here, uh, that if the member uh, opposite wants to see precisely where those uh, beds have been built, more than 10,000 since coming into office, yes, Mr. Speaker. We are committed, we are providing those resources in a sustainable fashion. Thank you. I've never seen one. The member from Prince Edward Hastings will come to order. Supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I would like to see the list because I've been asking for two years in estimates and I've got nothing from you. Nothing. And you Show spend more money in prisoners than you do seniors. Mr. Here, Speaker, here. the minister's yeah. chronic underfunding has resulted in a lack of staff, lack of behavioural supports, increased attacks, 30,000 outdated here. beds, and a record high wait list of 26,500 seniors. Shameful. And that list is going to go to 50,000 in the next six years. Yep. The message is clear. Anything less than the rate of inflation is setting up our valued seniors needing long-term care support for a big disaster. So again, I ask, will the minister ensure our seniors' homes have the means to provide better care by committing to funding them, especially food and hydro, at a minimum for inflationary increases each and every year? Here, here. Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I, uh, I value the partnership that we have with those that are in that important position of providing long-term care to the residents of this province. Uh, and I appreciate, I greatly appreciate the submission that they've made, the pre-budget submission, where they speak to uh, the importance not only of the quantum that's provided, the dollar amount that's provided uh, for residents, and we provide uh, roughly $52,000 a year per resident, per home, Mr. Speaker. 
Speaker, uh, and uh, in a number of categories. Uh, but it's also I particularly appreciated when they were talking about the aspect of predictable and sustainable. And I've been working uh, with them, uh, and it's important for us to see if we can find a way, Mr. Speaker, that we can not only meet that uh, sustainable requirement, but that we can do it in a way which gives them uh, predictability into the future with regards to uh, what they can expect Answer. so they can plan for that increase, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. To your question, the member from Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker, and my question is to the Premier. Hidden deep within last year's budget was this government's inexplicable decision to cancel autism therapies for children over the age of five. After blindsiding families that had spent years waiting for services, the decision was finally reversed Chief is under enormous pressure from across the province, or so they claimed. Now, almost a year later, evidence is emerging that many children over the age of five are still being denied services, therapies, and hope. Speaker, what does the Premier have to say to the families of children with autism that have had the rug pulled out from under them a second time? Thank you, Premier. Children Youth Services. Minister of Children Youth Services. Thank the uh, member for the question. Um, as the member knows, this is an important issue, and uh, as a government, uh, we see this as one of our uh, top priorities when it comes to working with uh, families here in the province of Ontario. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, we invested half a billion dollars of new money into this program. And, Mr. Speaker, by doing this, what we're doing is creating 16,000 new spaces across the province of Ontario. We're looking at, at uh, providing diagnostic and testing early. Uh, and creating more spots for that so young people get the type of services they need. And the member knows opposite that we've committed to launching a new program in June that will address many of the issues that, um, that this uh, province has taken on, not only uh, through this government's uh, tenure, but many, many years, decades, Mr. Speaker. So I'm quite proud of the direction we're in, and I would hope that the, uh, if the member opposite really wants to, uh, uh, to be briefed on That's where sir. we are and our progress is, she can sit down with me anytime and get that type of information in detail. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. And back to the Premier. Ontarians are tired of being fooled. In an open letter to the Minister of Children and Youth Services, concerned parents of children with autism noted that wait lists are still growing, services are still being reduced, and families have been left in the dark about how this will affect their children's lives. Every child in Ontario deserves the right to reach their full potential on their terms, not on your terms. Will the Premier do what she promised for families and commit to actually reinstating the services for these children? Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I've been across this province and I've talked to parents. I've met with parents in many jurisdictions. In fact, I met with parents, uh, parents that are from the members' opposite uh, jurisdiction, uh, parents from Ottawa in the Durham region. And, Mr. Speaker, I have met parents and they are very thankful for the direction we're taking. I get phone calls, I get emails, I speak to parents directly, and they're happy about the direction we're going. And I just want to give you some of the latest uh, direct funding numbers. That, uh, that we have here, Mr. Speaker. So we've had almost 2,300 uh, families sign up for the 8,000 initial payment. We've got 775 families that opt into receiving the $10,000. And these numbers continue because you know, Mr. Speaker, the families that were on the wait list can apply for the 8,000, then the 10, and then 10, and it continues until, until their services uh, are necessary. Yes, so I would hope the member opposite would wait until June to see what the new program is like, and then from there uh, we can have a conversation Thank about you. how we go forward. Any Thank you. The member from Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Minister, the building industry plays a key role in the lives of Ontarians. They build the places where we live, work, and spend our free time, and they help shape our communities, including my own community of Davenport. Today, the Ontario Home Builders Association is here at Queen's Park. The Ontario Home Builders Association was formed in 1962 to give residential builders a voice in the provincial government and to facilitate changes in the industry. Their members build the homes that shape our communities, Mr. Speaker, and they have been an important voice in the province. I understand that they have been engaged on a number of government priorities over the years, including updates to the province's building code. Would the Minister for Municipal Affairs speak about how the Ontario Home Builders Association 
has contributed to the decision Question. of government priorities. Speaker, thank you very much, and I want to thank the, uh, the member for the question. Speaker, and I want to begin by ensuring that all members of the legislature are aware that tonight there's a reception with the Ontario Home Builders uh, starting around 5 o'clock this evening in the legislative dining room downstairs. We hope to see uh, everybody there. Speaker, in my first go-round in this ministry back in 2014, it was a pleasure for me to meet through that experience the Ontario Home Builders for the first time and have an opportunity to announce our six-story uh, wood frame construction in the province of Ontario, intended to help the forestry sector, but also led speaker, I would say, from my perspective, uh, an unintended consequence at the time I tabled my private member's bill to see an ability to increase the amount of affordable housing in the province of Ontario that came forward as a result of that. Point being, Speaker, that through that process, we were able to have significant consultations with the Ontario Home Building Association as one yes, of sir. our key stakeholders. It's helped to forge that relationship with our government, and I look forward to talking more about that stakeholder consultation in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the minister for his answer. Our government is currently conducting coordinated review of the growth plan, Greenbelt Plan, Oak Bridges Moraine Plan, and Niagara Escarpment Plan. These plans work together to protect our natural resources, like prime farmland, make efficient use of existing infrastructure, and prevent sprawl by directing growth to already built-up areas. The coordinated review is the legislated 10-year review of these plans. I understand that our government will introduce updated plans in the coming months, and that these plans will be the result of extensive consultation dating back to 2015, which includes a report from an advisory committee and a nearly six-month public consultation period in 2016. I also understand that the Ontario Home Builders Association has been involved in the process throughout. Would the minister elaborate Question. on how the Ontario Home Builders Association has contributed its expertise during the consultation Thank process? You. Minister. Speaker, again, thank the member for the question. She's right. The, the OHBA has a, been a significant stakeholder for us through this particular review. It's a good chance for me to give a shout out again, Speaker, to, uh, to that panel that was chaired by David Crombie and included Leith Moore, who was the past president of the OHBA. I also want to recognize Neil Rogers, uh, recently elected as the OHBA's 50th president, and say uh, give a shout out to the CEO, uh, Joe Vaccaro, as well. Speaker, as the uh, as the member has mentioned, they are a significant stakeholder for us in this process. We're aware that the OHBA, OHBA has some 4,000 members. They've built more than 700,000 homes in Ontario in the last 10 years. And, Speaker, they are a significant contributor to the economy of Ontario, somewhere in the range of $45 billion to our economy every year. So, yes, they have played a significant role in our work on the coordinated land sure. use review. We look forward to coming for we look forward to coming forward with those plans in the near future, and we want to thank them. And all stakeholders for their input Thank you. in this process. Can you question the member from Oxford? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Futech, one of the largest employers in my riding, said that on a single hydro bill, the charge for electricity they used was $38,000. But when they add on the government global adjustment and other charges, the final monthly bill was, listen to this, Premier, $385,000. They run 24 hours a day to deliver just in time to car plants, so they can't shift production to use the ICI program. Can the Premier explain why this major employer is paying more than $350,000 or 90 per cent of their hydro bill for ex bill uh, government's extra billing charges? Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Very pleased to rise and talk about the programs that are out there that actually are helping businesses, Mr. Speaker. And I do hope that this one uh, one business will actually utilize many of the programs that are out there, Mr. Speaker, to actually help them save dollars. Mr. Speaker, there's the IE IEP program, Mr. Speaker. There's the uh, you know the industrial accelerator program. There are many other programs that are out there to actually help small businesses and help our medium-sized manufacturing businesses, Mr. Speaker, ensure that they can Remember reduce the rates. Through, come to order. We recognize, Mr. Speaker, the importance of actually helping our businesses reduce those rates. We've seen many of those businesses right across the province use many of these programs, Mr. Speaker, and then I'll actually help them reduce their bills. But when it comes to Ontario's Fair Hydro Plan, Mr. Speaker, we're going to see all of our small businesses, they're going to see that 25 percent reduction, Mr. Speaker, Answer. coming right off, and that's something that will help them, the Mr. Speaker, Prince and Farm, Hastings, right across time. the province. Thank you very much. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and the minister obviously missed the comment that I said these programs do not work for Futech and Woodstock. 
In the past few months, it's been announced that Oxford, and back to the Premier, Mr. Speaker, the past few months it's been announced that Oxford is losing a thousand new jo or jobs. This is the government's hydro rates for businesses are putting more of these jobs at risk. And yet the government's hydro announcement does nothing to help the major businesses we have left, which of course would be Futech. Premier, people can't pay their hydro bills if they lose their job. What does the Premier have to say to all the people of Oxford who are worried that their job will be the next to disappear because of her government's policy? Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Well, Mr. Speaker, here's what I say to the folks in Oxford, and here's what I say to folks right across this province. What do you say? We have taken a number of measures to make this province more competitive. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we have the lowest effective corporate tax rates, very generous R&D tax credits. We've invested with businesses to the tune of $3.1 billion. Stop talking. Member from Niagara West Glanbrook will come to order. Not amused with that comment. Finish, please. Our investments, Mr. Speaker, with businesses right across this province of $3.1 billion since 2004 have accrued over $31 billion in private sector investments, 175,000 jobs created and retained. So where are we, Mr. Speaker? We have not had a lowered unemployment rate in a decade. Mr. Speaker, not in a decade. Answer. We're leading the G7 in growth. We've created 700,000 jobs, and for the first time in 13 years, Mr. Thank Speaker, you. we've seen seven consecutive— Thank you. <laughs> The member for Prince Edward Hastings is warned. New question. The member from London West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, there is an ongoing crisis in mental health services in London that shows no sign of improving. The London Health Sciences Centre Psychiatric ER regularly operates at 130 per cent capacity. Before the March break, LHSC reported that there were 22 mental health patients waiting for beds, some for more than seven days, on hallway stretchers or in overflow rooms. Last week, my constituent Angela Jolly waited five days in the hallway before she was even assigned a doctor. Uh, Speaker, LHSC psychiatrist Dr. Ganjavi tells me that it all comes down to funding, funding that is needed for more beds, for more nurses, for more community services. London's mental health crisis has been raised numerous times in this legislature and in the London media. Question. So why, Speaker, does this government refuse to act? Okay. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and we absolutely are acting. In fact, we've made unprecedented uh, investments in mental health right across this province. Just uh, a number of weeks ago, an important announcement uh, for 1,150 new supportive housing units uh, to add to the uh, 1,000 that were announced uh, last year, Mr. Speaker, where we've announced for the first time any jurisdiction in Canada we're providing uh, government-funded, publicly funded cognitive behavioral therapy. In London itself, Mr. Speaker, not only do they benefit from the support of housing and are benefiting, but also we opened up a crisis centre which provides that critically important alternative to hospitalization or visits to ERs, where there are strong community support yes, and experts in place that can provide that resource that individuals in crisis so uh, definitely need, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, Londoners must wait six months or more to see an outpatient psychiatrist, and the 24-7 crisis centre that the minister mentioned was at capacity almost from the moment it opened its doors. About one-third of the people who access the crisis centre are diverted from ER, but fully two-thirds are first-time users of the mental health system. And the $10 million that was promised more than a year ago for additional stabilization beds has yet to 
appear. Will the Premier commit today to releasing that funding for those stabilization beds now to the crisis centre? And more importantly, will she come to London and meet with the nurses and the physicians and the patients who are struggling to deal with this desperate situation? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, that $1.2 million that we invested in the London Crisis Centre uh, is uh, obviously making an important difference uh, to individuals in that community. But we're also working with the hospital, Mr. Speaker, and we've provided them with significant new funding, including in mental health. And we've committed to, we're in the middle of a $140 million new investment in mental health over a three year period and $50 million annualized after that. But our funding to the London Health Sciences Centre has increased not only by 73 per cent since we came into office, but also a significant new investment in funds last year, which will help them deal yes, with sir. that to improve their capacity on this critically important issue, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Member from Oxford on a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise on a point of order. Under the Adjudicative Tribunals Accountability, Governance and Appointments Act of 2009, the Social Justice Tribunals of Ontario are required to submit an annual, annual report to the responsible minister within 90 days of the end of the fiscal year. Within 60 days after the responsible minister receives the report, he or she is required to table it in this assembly. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that the annual report for the Social Justice Tribunals of Ontario for the year 2015 and 16 is outstanding. And I'm not aware that the appropriate minister has provided this House with any explanation for the delay. So I request that you convey to the minister my concerns and those of the House that this particular report, which is required to have been filed, has not, in fact, been filed. Thank you. To be clear to the member, uh, that is not the duty of the speaker, therefore it's not, actually not a point of order, but I'm sure that the appropriate ministers should be on notice that all of their duties must be fulfilled on the timely pattern that has been out, outlined in the regulations and the rules. So I leave it at that for the member to make his point. The member from Northumberland, Quinty West, on a point of order. Speaker, I'd just like to welcome Mr. Steve Toby from Toby Development from Brighton. Welcome, Steve. Uh, Thank you. Member from Simcoe Gray on a point of order. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, in regard to my earlier submission, I would like to refer to you to the Minister of Energy's comments today during question period, where he said we will be tabling legislation to reduce hydro bills by 25 percent. The member has the member has the right to submit in, in writing another addendum to his report, as I've given the member as I've given the government the opportunity to do so and the third party to do so. Thank you. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.